These videos are offered on a pay-what-you-like basis. You can pay for the use of the videos at my website. There is a link to my website in the info box. The address is www.freelance-teacher.com slash videos dot htm or you can just use the link in the info box. By the way, I also offer tutoring via Skype and you can find more information about that Skype tutoring service at my website. Thanks. I find actually that I think uh, the ketone and the aldehyde stuff is a little bit more difficult than the carboxylic acid. So. Okay. But, but I don't know if that's how you... I mean, just the carbox, carboxylic acid just... I don't know, it makes more sense to me, but... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I, I would uh, agree with that in the sense, maybe we talked about this a little last time. So in, in all these cases, the main thing we're focusing on is a nucleophilic attack on carbonyls. We're focusing on nucleophilic attack on carbonyls. But we saw that when a nucleophile attacks an aldehyde or a ketone, there's at least four different patterns yeah. that it might go through. Whereas, as we're going to talk about today, when a nucleophile attacks a carboxylic acid or acid derivative, there's only one main pattern. That's so here on the board, uh, since I've only had to draw one main pattern here. This is the basic pattern for when we're attacking carboxylic acids and acid derivatives. So in that sense, I would agree. In that sense, this material maybe is a little bit simpler than with the aldehydes and the ketones. There's always complications, but that's one thing that makes things a little bit simpler. Well, since you've had a chance to, uh, to watch those videos, you've already been introduced, like we were just talking about, to some of the main reactions uh, that are involved here. Uh, your instructor spent a lot of time in the lecture notes on uh, nomenclature, and there's a lot of nomenclature here because there's a lot of different functional groups. So I was thinking that we would start by going over that. That seems pretty sure to be on the test. Okay. okay. Well, first of all, we just need to review the general names for these functional groups. And that, that's a challenge for a lot of people because I hope there are so many of them here. Do you happen to remember from the videos what the name of this type of functional group would be? Remember that what we have here, this X here stands for a halogen. And uh, acyl halide? That's good. Oh, that, that's good progress. Most, uh, most people don't learn that name. That's good that you remember that. Acyl halide. Really, those other videos have helped tremendously. Good, yeah, good. That's what they're there for. As I mentioned in the other videos, there's a name for a carbon chain connected to a carbonyl that's called an acyl group. If we remember that a carbon chain connected to a carbonyl is called an acyl group, then this is a very logical name, acyl halide. Sometimes these are also called alkanoyl halides. That would also be an acceptable name. Well, let, let's try to name some specific examples here. Okay. For each functional group, we have to learn what the suffix is. And it turns out that the suffix, the IUPAC suffix for acyl halides is oil, or oil halide. Oil halide is the suffix. So for example, this compound has one, two, three, four, five carbons. That would mean pent. There's no double bonds, so it's pentan, not pentene, like it would be if there were double bonds. And now we have to put in the suffix. Well, the suffix is oil, and we can name the specific halide we have here, which is chloride. So this would be pentanoyl chloride, two words. So this version actually gives you a clearer idea of what the suffix is, oil halide. In, in, uh, on, um, in this, the carbonyl is always going to be on the number one carbon then? That's right, if we're giving, if we're giving the acyl halide the suffix. Okay. That's right. That's right. Another way to put it is, by definition, an acyl halide is a terminal functional group, so we don't need to put in a locator. It would be superfluous to say one pentanoyl chloride. So you're basically right. It goes without saying that this is the number one carbon. That's right. 
if there was a double bond in there, it would just be pentatene oil, and then you would, it would you would have to uh, account numerically for where the double bond starts. That's a good point. Yeah. So, for example, what would be the name of this? It would be um, it would be uh, four pentene pentene oil. That's right. Chloride. Now this would be. for pentene oil chloride, just like you said. Now instead of saying and, we have to say ene okay. to indicate the double bond. And the four, because this is one, two, three, four, it's important that we start our numbering from the right and not from the left, because this is the principal functional group. So we have to give this the lowest possible number. So what would be a good name for this compound? Butanoyl chloride. But, because there's four carbons, and because there's no double bonds, and oil chloride, because it's an acyl chloride. That's exactly right. two carbons, and because there's no double bonds, and then oil chloride. Or bromide. Thanks. That's right. Bromide. That's right. Ethanol bromide. Now, one thing that I, I think you saw in the video on nomenclature for aldehydes and ketones and carboxylic acids is we talked a fair amount about common names as well. There's a couple common names that are used so often that you're almost always expected to know those. Uh, so we need a common name for this. Well, notice that this has two carbons. Do you remember what the common root is for two carbons? The IUPAC root for two carbons is F, uh, but when in the common system, there's a different root. Is it uh, sim it's similar? Is it as ACE? Or mm -hmm. I'm not sure I pronounced it. Okay, that. you're on the right track. Now, it's not acyl, it's acet. This is an important thing to learn, that the common root for two carbons is acet which is similar to, but different from this acyl idea. So acet means two carbons. I mentioned in that other series of videos that acet always means two carbons, except for one exception, which is acetone. Acetone has three carbons. But except for that one exception, acet always means two carbons. Well, that would be the appropriate thing to use here. And then, uh, uh, frustratingly, it turns out that the common system doesn't use oil anymore, it just uses ill. So this would be acetyl bromide. So besides the root being different, there's a slight difference in the suffix as well that just has to be memorized. It's conventional to write IUPAC names outside the parenthesis and common names inside the parenthesis. So here would be the common name. Now the fact is, in real life, people almost always use this common name for two carbon chains. People very rarely use the ethanol, so you probably would be expected to know this common name. Even though you've uh, look, gone through those other uh, videos, there's still a lot of material in this chapter. So I'm still, I'm not going to try to cover every single detail here. I'm going to try to pick out the stuff that seems to come up on the test the most. So we'll be skipping a couple of the more difficult nomenclature stuff. If you have time, you can always go back and uh, look at that on your own. But these are the basics. So the basics here are that these are named as oil halides. 